Hi, I'm Larry Butler for the East Hawaii Cultural Center, and my guest today, I'm so happy to have Stephen Friedman, who is the chairman of the board of the EHCC, and who is also a close personal friend of our artist that has just gone up in this gallery exhibit, Shingo Honda, a Japanese-American artist, ended his days on the big island of Hawaii, tragically died in 2019, or I'd be interviewing him, um, Steve is going to help us understand this beautiful show curated by Andre Kramars, and he's also filming this. Thank you so much. And Steve, I hope will bring us some insight on the show. Uh, let me start with just a little brief thing here. Shingo Honda was born in Niigata, Japan, up north in the snow country. He was educated 1964 to 68 at the... Uh, uh oh, Taina Fine Arts College in Tokyo, Japan. And Steve, you met him probably sounds like around 2006, and in fact, sponsored a little exhibit of his work at your own id space gallery. Why don't you tell us about how you met him and how you stumbled on his art? Sure, sure. Well, first, I'll make a disclaimer, which is that. I don't consider myself a Shingo Honda expert. There'd be four sources I'd refer you to if anyone is interested in getting to know more about uh, Shingo's work. That would be Lin Farr, his life partner who wrote four books, uh, Off the Grid Without a Paddle, and three other books which can be found on Amazon about him. So knowing the man, nobody knows Shingo better than Lin. The second would be there are several books on Monoha, which was the group of artists he emerged from in Japan in the mid-60s, and those would be more erudite than I am on that subject. Mm -hmm. And um, there would also be Andre Kramash, who spent hundreds of hours mm -hmm. sorting through 650 individual pieces of uh, art, paintings, drawings, and hundreds of prints, uh, which describe the breadth and diversity of his career. So um, there was a fourth source, but I lost that. Anyway, um, <laughs> Amari Sanjil, who lives on the Big Island and also represented Shingo Honda in Japan in his gallery, hmm. uh, pr apparently from near the beginning of his career for an extended amount of time and has written uh, extensively on Shingo. So there are many sources of expertise on Shingo. I'm not one. I'm going to talk to you as a friend of Shingo's and as, yes, somebody who stumbled upon him, not by accident, and um, has been able to be a good friend to him for all these years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it started uh, when I got to Hawaii. I, after a number of years, I came to miss seeing high-end fine art, and yet I discovered there were a number of high-end fine artists on the island, but no place where they could exhibit hmm. consistently. So EHCC notwithstanding at the time, this kind of exhibition wasn't available. And artists of his caliber weren't coming out of the woodwork. They were staying secluded. So I decided at a particular point to open my own gallery, which I did a gallery called Id Space. And Id Space? Id okay. Space, yes, a place for my Id to wander at my house. <laughs> and uh, I think the way I came to know Shingo was he was introduced by a mutual friend and I was taken up to his house and looked through his work and was just absolutely flabbergasted to see hundreds of pieces of extremely diverse work on many occasions. From the first time I arrived at Shingo's studio, he showed me through probably 50 pieces and he said, now you've seen everything I've done. <laughs> and uh, I, I was overwhelmed that anyone would have done so much in their life that mm -hmm. of such quality and I offered him an exhibition and over the years each time I visited he would show me another 50 pieces that I'd never oh, seen heavens. even as Andre installed this exhibition Lynn his wife said there are several pieces she said I've never seen that piece <laughs> so there are hundreds of magnificent works of a very high standard and I thought I'd give him a show. I ended up possibly there were close to 10 exhibitions between all the exhibitions at id space and then the ones at 
Andre has curated here. Mm -hmm. This is actually our third EHCC exhibition of his work. Uh, and one thing that strikes us all is that each one featured a different period of his artistic career, and they're so very, very different. Um, what do you make of that? It could be the third, it could be the fourth, because he did one while he was alive, ah. I believe. Mm -hmm. But um, what I mean, that's possibly why Shingo and I connected. As an artist, we, as artists, we had something very much in common, which is that we explored a singular idea for an expanded period of time. And within that idea, we developed certain linguistic factors, which we permutated and expanded upon until that language was exhausted. And then we had to reinvent our language as artists. He, since we're talking about him, specifically would do that about every five years. I see. And I should have mentioned, Steve is also quite a noted ceramicist. And uh, this is your particular art. Well, Shingo and I exchanged works. I wouldn't bring myself into this story mm -hmm. because that's not interesting, but the only story I can tell about Shingo is a personal one. And um, he, I can tell you just uh, weeks or days, I don't know, before his death, he came to my studio, he opened the door, he walked in, he wasn't invited, he didn't announce himself. <laughs> he walked around the studio, looked left, looked right, <laughs> walked in, looked at all the work, went upstairs, I just stood there, he came downstairs, <laughs> he said, you're still here, I'm glad, I'm finished, I'm not making any more work, I'm done, thank you for being here, goodbye, and well. he left. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's take a look at some of the work. Um, this particular series, Parallel, maybe you could explain it to us as we walk through the gallery. Sure, well, let's go to number one. Mm -hmm. So speaking of him developing languages, each body of work tended to bring in different parts and elements which began from his uh, period as a specifically Monaha artist. Monaha was translated as the school of things. It was a conceptual art movement in the late 60s, early 70s in Japan. Monaha. Mm -hmm. Monaha that um, was loosely parallel to the conceptual art movement in the United States, except it was very specifically founded in the aesthetics of Japan at the time. And Shingo did a lot of works, uh, giant concrete blocks roped to pillars and other pieces of that kind. So in that, that period, period, he was doing actual installations mm -hmm. with yeah, rocks and logs and rope and yeah. floorboards and... Yeah, uh, Ufan Lee, I don't know the names of the other Monaha artists, but they're, they can be easily found. They, they were all part of that school of artists. And what you see in these original pieces here in the parallel series are elements from a number of different phases, probably still contending with the issues of space and object that he began with. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that a giant block of concrete might be tied to a pillar. When he moved it to another site, there was no pillar. I believe at the Guggenheim or somewhere where he moved it to, there was no pillar, so the rope was just left lying on the ground. So it was liberated. Yes. <laughs> um, Interesting. Yes, yeah, so the elements of the, the photographic type uh, gener uh, generations of figures are uh, borrowed from some early series of his, which were embossed photo engravings in which he started to introduce people into spaces that were juxtaposed in non-linear ways. Uh, this borrowed on that idea that it put him on a field of highly painterly background, because you notice they're not flat, they're extremely yeah, there's a lot textured. of gesso texture, there's some crack allure in some of them. And actually a lot of painterly quality. If you look into the detail boxes, in some of the pieces, you can see myriad of uh, almost monochromatic, but subtly rich color patterning and uh, mm -hmm. evolving painterliness, which um, was uh, the flower series. And uh, uh, I think it was the case series, perhaps. 
um, where he elaborated on all of his painting skills. Mm -hmm. So that uh, begins the series and you can see evolves through a number of these pieces. So these were room. done in Los Angeles. He moved to Los Angeles, lived there, what, 20 some years after coming from Japan. Yeah. And I assume to some extent this is a, a result of maybe not culture shock, but a new culture. Oh, interesting people, different from what he's used to, acting probably differently. How much do you think LA is in this? Enormously. That's something that Shingo and I shared a lot too, is the, dis the discussion of how in a new environment your art reforms itself. Hmm. So this particular series resulted from him uh, walking around Los Angeles and um, photographing people. Lynn described to me Shingo going and standing at the top of a staircase and photographing people from odd perspectives, going and asking their permission always. Oh, that's and, good. <laughs> yes, always, and taking these shots. So, uh, yes, he, yeah, I think each body of his work, as you can see in his late work, uh, generated from Hawaii, his, uh, once a particular body of work was exhausted, a new body would emerge with a language that was specific to the new environment. And yes, I do think this is very um, LA driven. Hmm. Interestingly, the series before was, his, was based on flowers and they were also done in LA and they look very tropical, <laughs> strangely. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Now the paintings that Andre is filming right now are particularly painterly, I think, with textured gesso backgrounds and cracks and things interspersed with this very, very precise geometric ornament. Uh, one thing I've wondered is how much does the geometry interact with the people? Like, is it just casual chance interaction like a John Cage music piece? Or is he in fact trying to frame them and put them in places? Undoubtedly. Uh... While Shingo didn't speak very fluent, well, he spoke fluent English. He had been in the United States for decades, and yet uh, Lynn wrote one of her books speaking Shinglish about <laughs> the way Shingo <laughs> expressed himself. So uh, we understood each other on a bit of a different level, mostly for, with reference to the work. And he once described his work and his singular pursuit as uh, an exploration of unstable space. Unstable space. Yes, he mm -hmm. said that was his interest. His interest in everything he'd ever done was unstable space. Mm -hmm. So you can see the geometry and other ornaments being used to create spaces that are in balance and imbalance with each other. Mm -hmm. Two of our shows I know were titled Impermanence and yeah. there's a wonderful quotation in our literature as he talks about growing up as a child in the snow country of Japan and being absolutely fascinated by the brilliance and the impermanence of shattered ice. Well, since the camera is facing this particular piece, I think... Let's talk about this piece, well, sure. Well, I was regarding the issue you just spoke of because in some of his very last work in the, high, the Hawaii Noon series involves photographs, photographic imagery taken through the window of a speeding car on a rainy day. <laughs> and this piece to me is like a foreshadowing of that kind of an issue. Hmm. So, hmm. This one interests me because it strikes me as kind of more classically geometric than the other ones. A big stable pyramid and a triangle of people and a dot in the center. And yet it's utterly anom anomalous to the series in its usage of color and the veil through which you have to peer to see the pieces. I think a lot of times if you look through his series and any great artist, you'll see foreshadowings that sometimes come decades before. And this to me is almost a foreshadowing of things to come. Mm. While it may seem geometrically relatively similar, simple, I think the, the perspectives are but strange. The rushing me. horizontals, I, I know the pieces you're speaking of, yeah. um, taking out the car window, and they often have these horizontal streaks exactly. flashing through yeah. and little bits of jungle, little bits of rain and sunlight that we're used to in wet side Hawaii, yeah. <laughs> East Hawaii. So let's move to the, um, 
other, the other room of the show here because I think that's okay. a, a great first look. A beautiful show. Again, the show is curated by Andre Kramars. Put this together and is infinitely familiar with the work. And let me expand a little bit on that for a moment while we're moving. Um, Andre is putting together a catalog. I think the two of you are collaborating on a catalog of the works, and there are, what, 650 remaining? 650 individual pieces that wow. I think Andre has photographed so far. We're hoping to do a book at uh, some time in the future, and we're working together with uh, Lynn and um, yeah, doing our best. This particular piece is particularly uh, exciting because there are so many different parts of Tell what Shiva was interested in. If you would just walk us through the whole thing, that would be great. I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> in my disclaimer, I should have said, I'll say a lot of things that are not true, a lot of things that are opinions, and I totally accept that I get things wrong. I'm going to make a lot of it up because my story of Shingo's is a fiction created by a hundred meetings individually with him mm -hmm. and conversations, but on no highly factual based background beyond that. So well, this is a lot of people's favorite piece in the show. I understand. What is it that's so striking? You'd have to ask them, but I think that this piece carries the optimal rendition of a lot of the different the, the concepts that he's worked with, the painterly quality of the middle, the juxtaposition of figures separate yet parallel. And I think that was one of the things that Shingo struggled with. And I, I could be wrong about this. This is one of my fictions is that uh, he describes in his narrative about this body of work, the separateness and yet singularity of people all going about their business separately yet together. And mm -hmm. I think this piece describes that you know, very intimately. I think he mentions something about enjoying putting together people who had no connection with each other except there they were in his paintings together. I think Shingo, at least the little I knew of him, encountered the world that way too. Hmm. Shingo tended to stay very independent and very linked to people at the same time through his participation in, in Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, and ultimately becoming a priest. Oh my he, goodness. Um, he, he participated in his own experience of his separateness and his togetherness with his community. Uh -huh. Can we read that maybe into some of these perspective tunnels that he tosses in? Little surprise spaces like this one where we're almost invited to walk into some kind of arch. Uh, a lot of the paintings in the series seem to have these little windows to some other dimension in them. Well, great question because as an artist, we always ask questions like whether uh, we're traveling to another world or generating it. Mm -hmm. And in Shingo's case, whether religion inspired imagery or perhaps we generate a person, a particular kind of imagery because of the universal archetypes in all of us. And mm -hmm. we translate them into religious imagery. Late in his life, Shingo decided to burn all of his robes. He didn't though. He did. He did? Yes, yes. He, he came to me, he was discussing burning all of his work. Yeah. And at a particular meeting. And then at the next meeting he came and he told me he had decided instead to burn his robes. And so he burnt his robes. I see. And um, so I think his link spiritually to his work was ground zero for him. It was hmm. the bottom line. Isn't that interesting? When he burned his robes, did that also mean he was quitting the priesthood or was it just yes. an... It was. He stopped practicing. He yeah. stopped practicing. Yeah, I think he was interested in it for a minute, but I'm not sure that it was his whole life. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Again, when I look at a piece like this, I wonder about the Zen focus in his life, whether or not it was the biggest thing, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we've got all these figures, different groupings. We've got the geometry, we've got the large spots of color, and then in the center, this 
dazzling little window into yeah. somewhere else in a completely different texture. Um, again, it just strikes me as a wormhole we're going through or a tunnel to another dimension. And I, I wonder if that's a Zen inspiration or, or if it's just always been there in his work. Me too. There was a body of work called White Space. White or Space. Toward White Space, perhaps. And uh, yeah, his interest in what White Space could do for an image, for the, the objects that inhabited it, was part of his exploration. And definitely the sophistication of this body of work seems to me to be the most complex of his expressions, perhaps up to this period, perhaps at all. But of course, I'm not expert enough to know that. Huh. When I first saw this, I kind of giggled, actually. It looked to me almost like a Gerhard Richter had snuck into his painting. Some great cavernous Germanic space with those colors and light at the far end. And I <laughs> thought about imagining one artist visiting another artist through a work of art. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's stunning. <laughs> this, what other piece should we look at? Well, actually, this piece is worth a, a minute, too, because uh, Okay. For some reason, this piece always reminded me of Shingo Honda because it looks like Shingo Honda from behind. I've been assured it's not Shingo Honda. Okay. But I, I think it's an incredibly beautiful, iconic piece. It is funny. Oh, look, the dots here have acquired perspective and shadows or and something. Imagine where the light source would have to be for those shadows to be where they are. I see. So the light source would have to be central to shadow the dots in the directions they're going in. I think it's kind of a stunning masterpiece. Oh, I see. That's a beauty. Let me see when that was made. This series goes from about 2000 to 2004. Oh, this is one of the early ones. This is number eight, 2000. Okay. This is an interesting one with the, the colors. That's actually the last piece, or second last piece in the series, but um, we're here, I guess we have to talk about it. I would have naturally moved on to the evolution of the series, but this oops, particular oops. piece- I jumped the gun. Among the second last in the series, um, I think it's just stunningly uh, sophisticated ah. in its levels. Here you see a map, a street map, perhaps it's Los Angeles, it looks like it, with the Los Angeles River running through, I would never clue. <laughs> but um, all of the elements are, condensed into a, a small, powerful canvas, which ah. is a harbinger at the end of the series. Uh -huh. and I, I understand that as a friend of his and as an artist, that when a language is sufficiently explored, there's nothing to discover anymore. Mm. And mm -hmm. I think there are often two kinds of artists you find, I found out out there in the world. There are people who discover a language and then make a product, and they're ones who discover forever. And Shingo was only interested as long as he was learning from a series. As mm -hmm. soon as it was complete, he absolutely would not move further. Hmm. So the harbinger, but we'll move on to it. Sure, let's go back and be sequential here. <laughs> oh, these are fun. And I, I love the juxtaposition of these two. They're so very different. They're stunning, aren't they? You can see the they're later in the series where his sophistication is already complete. This one reminds me a great deal of Los Angeles with the, the smog set. You know, that looks like Los Angeles coming by airplane, doesn't it? It really this does. This enormous grid pattern with a brownish pinkish glow over what it. They used to call it five <laughs> country towns strung together. Now more like 50. I had not thought. I was just struck because this one is so much more kind of traditionally spatial than a lot of the others with a, you know, a vast perspective exercise yep. over the landscape. That could almost be early Renaissance. It's highly readable, isn't it? And they're all leaping over these little... But they're they obviously in discrete spaces. Yeah, yeah, against the, the complicated wires or something on the ground in the great sky. And you can see as he's achieving mastery of the series, he's coming closer to the end of the series to, to exhausting what the, that particular perspective could do for him. What do you think he was pushing? What do you see increasing towards the end? Or what was the he trying to explore? The complexity of the cues, the, the cues of instability. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not just spatial. It's not just, of course, the geometries are extremely 
uh, complex in the perspectival cues. He's starting to open up doors and windows, mm -hmm. you notice, and through which I feel like I'm falling so often in his work, destinations, places he's going, the people are heading toward. And um, then the painterly quality is highly personal and emotional because uh, Shingo didn't deny emotion. That's one of the things he never did. He was very much a person in the world. He mm -hmm. consistently acknowledged that aspect of him. And I think the gestural, moody, stormy, painterly aspect of what he was doing was fully integrated into his earliest explorations of figure and field and the geometry that separates them and launches them into motion. Mm hmm. Oh my goodness. This is another one of the later ones. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's funny. I know it's not right, but I, I almost read this as Barack Obama. But of course, the, I don't I, think the I dates would read would... it as Rod Serling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that is interesting. We're dating ourselves. I think. We're dating ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm enjoying the way this one takes such big, discrete slices and challenges us to juxtapose the, the times, maybe more clearly than some of the others. Yeah, there, it's almost like a flat feature across the piece. Mm -hmm. this, this now, what have we got one. here? Andre is filming. Yeah, this is one of the... This is 20, number 26, 2000. Yeah. But you can see it's like a perfect resolution of all the ideas. I think this figure in the bottom right hand corner of the, the dot is kind of stunning. Yeah. I keep wanting to read the dot, the golden dot over his head as part of a narrative, but maybe yeah. that's wrong. You've seen too many Looney Tunes cartoons with the light bulb. Ah, oh dear. <laughs> no, it's ruined for you forever. <laughs> Perhaps for all our viewing audience forever. <laughs> huh. Now, do you know anything about the geometry that he's using? Is there any special formula or something that only he would know? I don't think so. I think it's perspective work, normal drawing perspective work, but a lot of it's intuitive, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. A mm -hmm. friend of mine was talking to Andre about how he installs and he was looking for the rules by which he installs. Mm -hmm. And he said there are principles, mm -hmm. but at some point it becomes intuitive. Sure, sure. I'm thinking what I've learned about the Monoha movement that you mentioned, the Japanese conceptual movement in the late 60s, early 70s, there would be something stunningly simple. And then you read the text, you read the label, and you find there's just all these dimensions and references to temple architecture and creation myths mm. and, and life and death struggles. And you go back to the piece and it's five layers deeper than you realized. Uh, sometimes I think that's fair. And sometimes I think that the, as I said to you last time we spoke, the stories artists tell about art are much less interesting than the stories art tells about artists. Oh, I like that. Huh. Let's move on to the sure, what do we have here? Now, I'm fond of anything blue, so I was drawn to this immediately, but <laughs> that's... That's number four, that's one of the early ones. And here it looks like his precise geometry. He's almost mocking it in the center where the, it almost looks like the cracks are falling apart as a, a mimicry of this very precise that linear is work. Something isn't, and yet it's behind physically. And this mm -hmm. particular doorway is in front of the figure. I think a lot of the taped on marks that evolved um, are almost like something right in front of the lens of your perception. Mm -hmm creating, um, the first time I came through the exhibition, I became seasick. Oh dear. <laughs> Just because the perspectives <laughs> were throwing me. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, when people came into the opening, I suddenly knew where the floor was. <laughs> because I see. Just finally, like in the paintings. Yeah, finally the majority of people were on a particular plane. Without anybody in the room, it wasn't like that. <laughs> this is the last piece 
in the series that Andre found. Uh, it's number 37 in the series. And uh, yeah, you, the, the series is resolving. And like, as I understand from Shingo, once there was no more to be discovered, he was not interested in permutating, repeating, mm -hmm. and creating product. He was finished with it and then moved on to the next series. Hmm. Now this one really interested me because a previous show of his here at the EHCC featured an earlier block of work, all involved with giant ragged tulip and other flower designs on this wildly abstract expressionist painterly background. And I'm seeing that background popping up again here. It really quite surprised me. So to me, it's interesting that this is the last. It's almost like he's reverting perhaps to interest in sort of oh, abstract expressionist yes. feeling. Well, I think that's where you so often see the historicity of an artist, the elements that they invent to create their explorations being repurposed through subsequent series mm -hmm. to uh, the exploration of their concern from a different perspective. And I think that's almost like a signal that the series was ending, was that he was now, all of his other influence was starting to leak back in. And mm -hmm. I think this just before he moved to Hawaii and began a completely separate series. Mm. Do you suppose when he was painting this that he knew this was going to be a farewell, that painting? I'm not sure. As I, I experience it, it's a, it's a shock when you get to the last piece in the series. Uh -huh. You assume the language you're in, it's, it's freeing, it's elevating, it's liberating you, it's bringing you to a full expression of a particular exploration you're interested in, and then suddenly you've done it at its optimal and you're bereft because it's complete. Mm. This is a wonderful story you're telling us through the, the chronology here. Um, what else should we know, do you think, to appreciate the show or to appreciate the artist? Um, I wouldn't have a clue. There's so <laughs> many pieces of Shingo's work. If we get to make the book that we're hoping to make, I hope people can come to understand the evolution of an artist from his roots in Japan to his time in Los Angeles to his time in Hawaii and just understand the interface between the human being, his life, his relationships and the ways he went about pursuing his central theses uh, over with incredible honesty over decades. It's mm -hmm. kind of, I took my daughter, I'll just finish with this note. I took my daughter when she was quite young up to my younger daughter, Bella, to see the exhibition, uh, see the exhibition, see Shingo's work in his house. And she mm -hmm. spent hours looking through his work. And when we were driving home, she just said one thing. She had one question. Why is it all so good? <laughs> and by that she meant, why is it even? Uh -huh. You always expect to see bad pieces. Yeah. And one of the unique things that Andre and I discovered in Shingo's work was we didn't find holes to fall down. The work was just stunning all the way through. Gosh. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for Pleasure. sharing that with us. Um, our show is open through August and September, and we'd love to have people come and visit it. Our gallery is free. We're open, what, Tuesdays through Saturdays? And I'd love to have you all come and explore with us, and we really look forward to the, the publication eventually of this remarkable body of work we can only hope that, uh, that you and Andre have worked so hard on. And thank Andre for the incredible installation. It's very beautiful. It is stunning. It is very yeah. beautiful. Okay, thank you.